What do we have done yesterday? We have done all the hard work yesterday. It says, I want to find some matrix element. And then we go to this LSD thing. And it's just all right in a very rough way because it takes forever to write it correctly. So there is some integrals. And then there is some e to the i kx thingy. And then there's the Dirac operator. OK. I'll be very sloppy and I write it as square root of box. And then in the middle is the time order to stop. And then on the other side is like a mirror image of whatever happens on the left. There are some integrals, so there are some e to the i k x stuff. There is some other square root of box operator acting to the right. So this is our key result coming from you worked really hard to do it in your mini homework to get this. And then, then there is something that uh, says, oh, we can just write down the interaction action, stick it in the middle, and change the <coughs> vacuum into the real <coughs> true vacuum. And there's more time order. And then, there's, then we can say, oh, we go to the interacting picture. Then we can just use free field. And then the upshot is we can expand this interaction Lagrangian. And then the only thing we need to do, as doing physics is all about, is to do two things. And this is exactly what we did like yesterday, is we figure out if we, I only have a two field operator, and if you do a time ordering of that, uh, what it gives. And this. Let me give them some dependence on the space time. What do we have seen? We call this a Feynman propagator analogous to the scalar case. And we realize it's nothing but a huh. I'll explain this later. It's it's nothing but a semi differential operator acting on the bosonic propagator. And then we always want to emphasize is a fermion operator has spinner index. Well, if you think about things propagating, it's telling us how one component of the fermion field propagates to some other component of the fermion field. So it can't really directly tell us how this four component thing becomes this four component. So that is not a surprise that the fermionic op uh, Feynman fermionic operator is actually a matrix. OK, I've been thinking this notation wasn't that crucial until I thought about it today. Maybe, maybe it's a time to introduce. Of course, I already use it in the lecture notes. Is that uh, Feynman decided that whenever we see some vector contracted with gamma matrices, he introduced this slash, which will be crucial on Friday afternoon when I'm facing a bunch of gamma matrices and the traces and have like eight of them in one line. But the thing is that it's, there's a story about this notation that uh, there is a very important conference on quantum field theory. And uh, Fermi, Enrico Fermi, like, uh, who is known as the last physicist, is both a great theoretical physicist and 
experimental physicist, and said, apparently this guy doesn't take much notes, but during that conference, he take tons of notes of Schringer. And he organized this group who is faculty and the students, and they study these notes. They study for weeks. Every week, they spend like hours gathering somebody's office, and they got exhausted. And then one of the person suddenly asked, isn't the Feynman there too? What he was talking about? Nobody remembers. Everything, everybody remembers. The only thing everybody remembers is this notation. So it's a very useful notation. So from now on, I'll start using this notation. Is that uh, whenever there is thing has a space-time vector index contracting with gamma mu, we'll write it as slash. So you probably would have seen this very often. OK, so I think that's where we were. And uh, the next thing would be ask what is actually the bosonic operator. The bosonic operator is actually d4p, p squared minus m squared, with some i epsilon prescription to tell us where to take the contour. And then, of course, it comes with this thing. Yeah, that should it, it, it's something you have seen. And then now we want to ask what's the fermionic operator then? Well, it just act that up. Act to this differential operator onto this x brings down a minus i p. There's already an i here, so they combine together to be p. So i minus i p gives us p. So what do we have is boson, whatever we have for the bosonic case. And now with the new notation, it has a p slash plus m there. And this part doesn't change after this. So I guess the useful thing is the momentum space if you just write momentum space, you just write, read whatever is in the middle, and then write it down. And this is our propagator. Sometimes you will see people write it this way. For me, it's weird, because it has 4 by 4 matrix on the denominator. It's a useful way to, when you do some sketches and hopefully these things cancel, it's, uh, it's, you can't really use it for calculation and it doesn't really make any sense to divide this thing. But it's, it, in one way it's true that if you multiply this way, indeed it does give you that. So. So, then, okay, so that's still part of the propagator, and uh, there's one more comment I want to make about propagator, then one more comment about a weak rotation, and then one more comment to summarize your, yes, the, the homework I did four minutes ago, then we'll move on, actually find a theory to calculate. Okay. So comment one is about uh, another look at a causality. So remember that the causality says, we say, oh, fermion field anti commute, they don't commute. But then they would be like, oh, no, who cares? Nobody actually ever seen a, a fermion field. The only thing we ever care about is some anti comedy. And of course, you should, we should 
know that they always come, come with a spinner index, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Because the psi times psi bar and the psi bar times psi are different objects. Okay, so let's look at this, which is what tells us about a causality. And as we often say, when we realize something that uh, is doesn't have a creation or annihilation operator in it, and it's a number respect to the Hilbert space, we might as well just take it as the that. It's like the value of five is always five. The value of fx is always fx. As long as you don't hide some like annihilation creation operator. In it. And we can do this because during the anti-commutator relationship, all the operators disappear. It itself does have those operators, and we can't just do it. OK, so let's just write down what happens. Sorry, now that they have a dependence. I'm just saying this is the anti-commutator, and I'm writing out the anti-commutator. <laughs> There's nothing fancy about this. It's like A anti-commutator B equals AB plus BA. So now I decided to choose that x0 is bigger than y0, because that's when we have a time ordering showing up, and then things actually we know how to interpret. So then, if we allow us to call this thing, call the thing we call the propagator or a propagator, so now we can try to interpret. It says that the psi, psi has B and the C dagger. Where should I write it? So psi is equal to something, EVP, something, something B plus something something C dagger. And the psi bar will be something something C plus B dagger. So now we'll say psi bar will create a B particle, which is we call the particle, at time y0. And this particle gets an annihilated. On the other side, at a, it, the, the, this particle, it's still there. So this creates the B particle on the left side. So it says it's a particle propagating from y0 forward in time, is what this term says. Okay. It's not a very illuminating picture, so I'm just right. Particle, particle moving forward in time. And then let's read what the, interpret what this is telling us. Well, this is telling us psi creates the anti-particle and it creates at x0. And then it becomes the anti-particle at y0. Great contrast. So that's why you often say that the causality is conserved because outside the light cone, the particle moving forward in time is canceled by the antiparticle moving backward. And uh, yeah. So a second comment is weak contraction 
far. More than two fields. It's good to know but, uh, how to do it. And then there's some dot dot dot. And the idea is that uh, I could have the we, I could have wanted to contract Psi 1 at the Psi 3 bar. That's something I could have wanted to do because it, the weak theorem says it's all contractions anyway. So if you want to do all the possible contractions you can ever think of. Then if I don't do that, that, then of course I want to move them all away from the rest of the operator. It's hopeless to move this way because all this dot dot means like all the operators I don't know of. So the only chance is to move this guy forward. And then you know about the fermions by now that if you want to swap them, you pick up a minus sign. And they are still <coughs> huge groups. And then, oh, but now they are weak contracted, which is by definition our Feynman propagator. And now we have the other bunch of stuff. Yeah, so the weak contraction work just like the bosonic case, you want to find all the possible contractions you can ever find, which I'm sure you have some practice with. And uh, fermionic case just means whenever you contract anything and they want to make use of the fermion propagated, we definitely want to do that, then you pick up some minus sign. Yes? Um, will it still be Probably, I think it works for, and even for this. I think I think you're right. I'd like no more. No time order. You're right. Yep. So so the upshot is that. You can do a contraction just as you have done before if you have thought of that as a distant past because we jammed so much stuff before last time you do it and today we're going to do more today. We'll have enough practice with contracting two fields out of uh, the time ordering things. Okay, so now let's so keep this in mind. This minus sign is important, very important, because that will lead to a additional Feynman rule that doesn't exist in bosonics. But let's talk about uh, the homework I was reading last night, and I'm sure now that I have all of them, but that I can't be reading them. So what I ask you guys to do, and I think you guys give me. A, I don't know, feels like your answers are like, oh, this is very trivial. Why do you want me to do this <laughs> compared to, you know, your last two homework? Okay, the point is that I ask you to show that this thing being acted by a Dirac operator is some distribution, which means it is a, it's a Green's function, and it works the other way too. Also work for Dirac operator acting from right.
well, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this should be Yeah? This shouldn't be a surprise. This is what you just did yesterday or this morning, which preference frame you work with. Okay, and then I forgot to ask the important question. I was kind of a hope that you guys ask yourself. Why do you think it's important for a propagator to be a Green's function of the Dirac hop? Can okay, be more specific? <laughs> that, that's, that's true. Okay. Some mm -hmm. external legs. Amputation. The amputation. So you have some Dirac operator and you get some propagator out if you have, if it's a Green's function, which basically they are inverse to each other. But in dense fancy distribution language is because there is a distribution and you can perform your integral as if this crazy stuff outside our time ordered this thing and the propagator never exists because they cancel. Well, they cancel to be a third distribution that get integrated somewhere else. That's why that in bosonic case, the external like it would be like, what? Because they cancel. So that's where that family rule is coming from. So without actually we get into details of deriving the Feynman rules, what do you think we will get out of the LCSD fermionic formula? Ah, actually I made an error and nobody points out. Sorry. I'm sorry for my error, but please look at this LSD formula and what a very important thing I thrown away that I didn't remember to write. The use, where did the use go? I have no idea, I've eaten them. Thank you very much, because they certainly have to be here. Okay, now, honey. Now it's even better to ask you the question now that uh, you have corrected my formula. Now, based on the fact that this Dirac operator, the propagator is Dirac operators, green function, sorry, I can't do it anymore. I'll just say they are inverse to each other. It's a jargon that it's not accurate, but it's much easier to say the green function thing. Okay, so now use the fact that these operators are inversely related with some propagator you're going to pull out with the weight contraction. What do you think the fermionic uh, rule for external leg would be? Before, they don't have this stuff. There's some klein garden operator and a klein garden field, they just cancel. The little kind garden propagator, they just cancel. Mm -hmm. so, hmm? so, what do you think the fermionic external lag would look like? Uh, you will have this U of V, or well, where else it could be. These things can only come from external lag because at this point there's no internal point yet. So all we got is the external lag. And we just said that uh, these things cancel. And this thing has to be somewhere. So now we already sort of know what uh, the external lag will give us. Basically, some of you, some of these depend on who, what we are scattering. Of course, to really extract the Feynman rules, we really need to look at the amplitude. But now we, we know what we're expecting. We're expecting these U's, these U bars, must show up in our Feynman. Yeah? Because at this point, there's nothing perturbative. We didn't even do the perturbative theory. This is the exact result. The exact result says, as long as you sign, the, sign two, two fermions, get the two fermions out, this U's and the U bars will pop up. And they're the same as you are sending in U's and the U bars pop up.
Okay, maybe we'll to make a note to ourselves of these Feynman rules that we are going to discover today is that uh, if I have some fermion come in to a vertex, yeah, that's what a dense notation. There is a fermion and it's coming into a vertex. It seems we pick up some E. Okay. Crucial that you understand that where oh, this time oh, is come from. But at this point, I will assume that uh, you are curious where they come from. Then we say fermions are coming out of vertex. This is the auto going, so this is the other incoming fermion. And this is the all the coming fermion. I'll use a different letter. And according to LSD, it seems the guy is coming out, which is a three and a four. It has U bar in. This is so far we got. Just by looking at the LSC reduction formula and looking at the fact that uh, the propagator and the direct operator are inverse. Without doing any calculation. Further calculation. And the further calculation, as I have advertised, will be a bunch of weak, weak contraction. How much calculation we're gonna do you actually crucially depends on how satisfied you will be by the accuracy of our extraction process. If you just let me handle it really hard, then it will be less quick. But if you really want to sh make sure that uh, things are exactly right, then we'll do a, a little more quick. But uh, are we all clear? We already have, have two Feynman rules for Fermi. Any questions? Nobody is curious about why I'm drawing, drawing two arrows? No? Oh, very good. Now, if you remember, you guys learned about this charge thing from the complex scalar. Great. OK, awesome. So yes, the arrow on the line indicating the charge, which for fermion theory, we always make it indicating the fermion. So the anti-fermion will have the different arrow on the line. And of course, the momentum, well, the arrow always points towards the momentum. <laughs> All right? Are we good? Chapter, who knows what? But, um, okay, for the rest of the time, before the break, before we start the calculation, I'll just tell the story. <coughs> for however long I'll tell the story. So the story, I'm telling a story because, well, this is at a point. So this is basically as far as we can get without knowing the interaction. This is crazy. We actually know some Feynman rules, but even we don't know about the interaction. They, they still have to go like that. 
But now that there's not much I can do with general things, we really have to pick a specific theory. So the theory I picked for you is called the Yukawa theory. So the reason for me to pick this is let's build our interaction. We know how to do that. OK, let's see. We learned about a scalar. We learned about fermion. So how do we couple them together? <coughs> what? We have a psi, and we have a phi. So uh, yeah? Psi, psi, sorry. It's almost right. Oh, I have to use the answer. Okay. Yeah. So we know psi bar psi is a scalar, phi scalar. So that definitely is Lorentz environment. I don't know what else I want. So that could work. We are just using the first entry in our bilinear light list. Since it's a scalar, we'll marry it to the scalar. And then they live happily after. And I could say, since well, it's a simple theory, it's intuitive to write down, we might as well study it. And of course, when you cover rotate it down, says that uh, I want to study nucleon-nucleon scattering. So proton, neutron scattering. And he proposed that there is a scalar called a mass on, is carrying the force. And that's why when he write down this theory, he write down a coupling constant. Well, actually, this is a good point to do this with a minus sign because you know he's studying specific phenomena, and you have to fix the sign to respect the phenomena. <coughs> now that is a good time to ask a question. Okay, what's the dimension of a phi? One. Okay. What's the dimension of uh, psi? One and a half. Huh? One three half, one half. Well, that's the same. Okay. Good. So three half, another three half. So together is already four. So this is dimensionless. This seems a silly thing to ask, but it will become important in QFTQ. Hey, yeah? Can you explain again how you get the dimensions of the fields? OK, so we always, when we do that, we always write down the other important terms, which is the term we have been studying all along. OK, well, to do that, I have actually have to write down the action. So the action is the integral of d4x of the Lagrangian, which is the one that we have been writing down forever, except I'll use this slash thing. So the way to figure out the dimension of the field is always starting with an action. Because the action, you know, is something you might remember they show up to exponents. It's like uh, in Dyson formula, that's an interaction action. It shows up on the exponent. And you know that it doesn't make any sense to take exponent of something dimensionful. So action is a thing we hold clear that it is dimensionless. Then we start from there and start counting. So this is. So whenever we ask uh, what's the dimension of a field, we're always asking about the mass dimension. And then, so there is already length to the force over here. And you know we're in this funny unit where you can show that the length is actually inverse mass. So, so <coughs> length is equals to divided by C is equals to time because 
length is related to time with c and c is 1. So they are the same. And the next thing to do is to notice the, um, the uncertainty principle says this thing is h bar related to some h bar thing, and h bar is also taken to 1. So these are all equals to inverse of energy, but energy is mass. So basically, this is something happened very often. I don't know about other field, but in particle physics, it's very often that uh, there is only mass. Everything is measured by mass, but all by energy. Yeah, you, you talk about anything, it's GeV. Like proton mass, who knows we're in kilogram, but it's one GeV. So that's where it comes from. <laughs> so then, equipped with this, we know that we have negative four mass dimension. So the Lagrangian had better provide that positive four mass dimension. So this whole thing had a better be mass dimension to the four so that together it's nothing. So there it's, okay, let me write this with mass dimension to the zero. Okay, so it's the easiest to look at the mass term. You have two psi. And mass, of course, has mass dimension one. Otherwise, it would be a very weird definition. So this guy provides one, and the other two provides three. So they each provide three half. So this is how you find the mass dimension of the field for any field, for in any dimension. And this is a very good question, because this is basically your interview question in QFD2. I would say it's not uh, approximately unity. But definitely about 50% of you, two of us will be looking at you says, oh, write down a theory has in this dimension has this kind of vertex. What's the mass dimension of this field? It's a little far away, but it's an interview question. And there's no way we're going to cancel that interview question because it's very related to the second week, which one you learn renormalization. OK, very good. So Yukawa theory is a, has a coupling which, has, which doesn't scale the mass dimension. It's a dimensionless constant. And we, ha we also have a Dirac action. It's, so it's nice. Then you can write down the Klein-Gordon log and Then we have the whole thing to study. So we, I could say, let's stop here and keep on studying. But I promise that. I will tell you a story why this is really interesting because, you know, after quark theory is born, who cares about, uh, well, it's still interesting. It's an effective theory of the whole thing. But this theory, as I mentioned, is somehow related all the way to the question you guys asked me, what is chirality? It's a very good question. When somebody says, let's study this important thing called a calorality, well, fermions, it's very important. Like, I really, I'm really glad you asked the question. I was actually uh, oh, ashamed of myself, didn't think about it. I should show you some experimental evidence that they are important. So now I'll tell you the story about the other Yukawa. It's the same Yukawa theory, but it's applied to a different region, and that is in the standard model. So let's start with the, the, theory, the, the question you guys asked, is what's chirality? And why do I care? At first, it seems it's just a mathematical thing. If you're a mathematician, you realize, hey, Lorentz group has two irreducible representation, which is even smaller than the Dirac spinner. Oh, cool. But on the other hand, you know, nature is compulsory. It's like everything can happen, will happen. So at, uh, in the 1950, I guess, five, six, and uh, people began to ask if there's any way that we can observe this. And you were like, how to observe chirality? You defined it as eigenvalue of gamma 5. How is gamma 5 somehow from a pure number matrix suddenly upgraded to some observable? That sounds like crazy. But it's actually not crazy because remember the little mirror thing we did in class? 
that if we're talking about a well, well fermion, the fermion is massless, really well defined, has a left handedness of right handedness, and you had a mirror in your hand, and then you flip, you realize a mirror of fancy parity will flip your chirality. So asking chirality is realize the in nature or not is the same question I ask is parity conserved or not? If it, if parity if parity is a good theory, then we would never observe anything like a chiral. Chiral means the thing that uh, there is a preferred hand. If your both hand behave exactly the same in nature. It's called a parity. The symmetry is conserved. <coughs> then this thing is, then this is just math. There's nothing physics about it. But as I said, in 1950-ish, people start to just try to Thinking about this idea, maybe parity is not conserved. Why it is conserved? And until Yang Zhenning and Li, Li Zhengdao, I, I'm their Chinese, so I don't really know how to pronounce their English name. <laughs> <laughs> so Li and the Yang. Yang is the same Yang as the Yang Mills, that you're going to study a lot and might not like it. But <laughs> I hope you like them. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's these two guys. Then they, they not only just, you know, toy with the idea that a parity might not be conserved, but they actually proposed an experiment that says, if you do this experiment, and if the parity is not conserved, we should observe this. So it's not their original idea that this thing is not conserved, but they has a concrete experiment. Well, on the other hand, then you know they, they got a Nobel Prize for this, and then they just began, they were friends before and after that they just completely like they both try to claim it's their own idea and then they fight for it. Yeah, yeah, it's not a, it's not a good story. But anyway, they proposed an experiment and it was basically ignored. Nobody cares. But everybody still believe parity is conserved. Why? Because we have strong evidence that uh, Maxwell theory is parity conserved. They have experimented with evidence. Strong force is also parity conserved if you play with nucleons. And so nobody really cares. And then, so they call this really, you see, I'm getting excited. The, their colleague, Wu Jianxiong, which is their, and the she, Decided not to go back to China for her, her Christmas break, literary Christmas break. Her experiment was done in 1956 between Christmas and the New Year, because she think this is important. So, and of course, you know, as a she in 1950-ish, you know, nobody really thought about giving her a book. Anyway. And they like, she did experiment by, so the proposed, I don't know what proposed experiment is, say this thing will decay into nickel. Okay, I know this. A neutron decayed into a proton. Still six. But then, the, but then this thing further decay. Let me not embarrass. Not, I'm just not going to read it. So what, it stu what is studied is the beta decay. Beta, beta decay, like people know for a long time, and that's why, I mean, Fermi proposed the neutrino, is that there is always energy escaping, and you just say the electrons. So this is known for a long time. And this special thing also decay, oh, sorry, to photon. So when, after this thing decayed, it goes to excited states, and um, then the, you know, if you're in the excited states, you lose your energy, you meet a photon. So people know this thing forever. And then what is pointed out is that uh, this 
nuclei, you can point to your spin somewhere. And if your if your parity conserved, which direction the electron coming out shouldn't be correlated with the wherever this spin points to. And of course, you say, how do you measure spin? So this is where the smart thing to do. First, she has lowered the, the temperature to be really close to absolute zero. It's like 0 0.003 Kelvin. So that, you know, thermal things is not good for experiment that you want to line atoms up. So he does that, and then everything is lining up, sort of. Because it's experiment. But the point is these two photons. Because we know these two photons coming from the QED, and they respect parity conservation. So what she look, she's looking for is the electron distribution, but like, like use this as a group. Like it's a comparison study. So, so he, she says, I know this thing, however this photons distribute, it must be parity conserved. And if I observe the electrons in some preference to way regarding to the photon background, then that means parity is broken. And then she saw that. Nobody believes her, especially Polly. Polly says, that's absolutely nonsense. Well, she was right. <laughs> but anyway, there was like confirmed the experiment. So the point is parity is in, indeed broken in specifically in this weak interaction. Well, it just doesn't happen as often as other interactions. And then so people realize if I want to build a theory that describes a weight interaction, we better use left-handed fermion and the right-handed fermion and ask them to be living in different representation. Or in other words, ask them to carry different gauge charge, charge risk back to this wind wake interaction. Otherwise, so that's where the left, why this left-handed fermion, oh, I was using W, so there's W plus, there's W minus, says B cannot change the same way respecting this interaction. And if you, re re if you think about it, this is not a really good. Because if you write down the mass term for the Dirac field, the, in terms of the wild field, it looks exactly like this. It looks like the interaction of the wild field with a mass coupled. That means fermions cannot have mass. Awesome discovery, isn't it? Because we actually have five fermions have mass. It's pretty much confirmed. Like, I'm made of fermions and I have mass. Experiment to discover. So this can't be right. Cannot be right. Because weak theory says they don't transform the same way. So together, they're not going to be a good weak theory term. But the mass term says, this is the mass term I want. Then, actually, people continue to ask me the question. I don't understand why can I understand the fermion mass as an interaction. I was like, wow, that's how history changed. So the next step is to understand the mass as an interaction term. They just randomly write down something. A scalar says, what if the scalar happened to carry the charge such that the whole thing works in a weak interaction? But since you write down a scalar that carry one mass dimension, they will just write down a dimensionless coupling constant. And then, they, then there is the last step from Higgs, says that this field could have something called a Mexican hat potential. And then since the true vacuum here, Higgs has a expectation value. 
then the expectation value multiplied by this lambda will give us fermion mass. And since this is exactly an interaction between one scalar and the two fermions, it's called the Yukawa theory. I guess we'll take a five minute break and come back to extract the fermion rules from this very important theory. Um, we're back here. Now we're happy to study this Yukawa theory because obviously it's an important theory. And you will see them and all the glory of them again in standard model if you choose to pick the class. But I'll stop there. It says that, look, it's a theory that uh, has been used not just for the nucleon, but it's also used uh, for firm fundamental particles like fermions and Higgs. So let's study this theory, which means let's go back to this thing and grab that uh, thing I need to calculate and write down what it is. What it is is, I'm just copying down the board, but now we have a theory here. So that's what we have. Not to, before theory, we've done all we can. Now we have to look at the specific. So, Zeus order. Ah, Zeus order, there's no <laughs> interaction. You probably have seen it in your scalar part of of course, the, the particle just moving in their merry way, they never interact. Uh, we often say, who cares about that part? We know they exist. And then move on. Yeah, is this okay? Not too sloppy for you? All right. There's order. Merrily moving on. Something like that. Okay. It's called the elastic uh, stick scattering. Elastic. Nothing happens. And the first order. Well, first order, there's something. So let's just bring this exponent out. And then write all the rest of the stuff. Can somebody tell me what happens? How many scalar fields do we have? What happens if I have one scalar field? Uh, That's the one end up uncontracted. That's the one end up uncontracted. And what happened if I want to figure out the vacuum expectation value of a single scalar field? Zero. Zero. Because either this guy annihilated to the right or it annihilated to the left. Either way. So if you can split it in half, one half will annihilate this part, one half will annihilate that part. So whoo, you don't get a contracted, you don't make contribution. All right. Second order. And we are moving rapidly. In this speed, we can calculate to five loops at the end of the day. <laughs> Ooh, let me chew <laughs> if this is the speed we do our calculation. Oh gosh. So let's say these guys are the Y, this guy is at the Z. Okay, again, what happened to the scalar field? Question mark. Huh? They are contracted. Ta da! No, it's. Come on, you look at the watch, you would know this is not going to take terribly wrong, long. It might be longer than the normal calculation we do. 
but it wouldn't be that terrible. Yeah? Okay. I'll just skip the writing down the vacuum part because I know it's between, between the vacuum, otherwise I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah? The only thing we need to do is figure out how this eight uh, fermionic field will contract with each other and give us stuff. You were like, eight hey, fermionic field, are you crazy? But think about it, it's not that crazy. What a kind of things you can just forget about it and not contract. Is there any trick? Something Dan called the non not so interesting contribution? Huh? Vacuum bubbles. Vacuum bubbles, okay. If we have vacuum bubbles, we don't worry about it. What else is not interesting? Disconnected. Disconnected. Wonderful. Because now we're in a much, much better shape. Because if I ever contract an external leg with an external leg, that's certainly going to be disconnected. There's no way for an external leg, connected external leg, to be ever going to include it in the Feynman diagram, per se. Okay, so excellent. So if you think about it, it's not too bad. We are only, the only interesting contribution coming from the external leg contracted with the internal leg. And we are fermions. Okay, fermions are annoying most of the time. <laughs> but fermions also says you can't contract per se with per se. You can, but you get a zero. Which means literally what I'm asking you guys to do is to contract, contract the two per se from the external part to the two psi bar from the internal part. And then do the same, two psi bar coming from the external part and the two psi bar, the two psi from the internal part, yeah? So it's not that many choices. Before you were like, oh, eight choose two, and then six choose two, <laughs> but it's not that. Okay, so let's try to do that. I'll pick this guy to be contracted to that. That fits the bill. It says it's a external to internal, psi to a psi bar, right? And then I can also do the next guy to a psi bar. And then I can do this bar thing to a psi, and this bar thing to a psi. Yeah. And then remember, if I just switch whoever is connecting to Y, now I decide to ask it to connect it to Z, that's not going to give me a different calculation. It basically cancels this factor for one half. I'm sure you guys are more familiar with this symmetry factor, where is the one over four factorial coming from way more than me. But I'm just pointing out, if I decided to whoever connect to Y, now I'm attacking Z, whoever is attacking Z, attacking Y, that's not giving me anything different. Yeah? So, what else can I do? Is there anything that is actually different? So what I did is four gets to attack to Y, three gets to attack to Z. One gets to attack to Y and two attach to Z. So, what do you think? Okay, let me make it. So, what happens in this diagram is the four gets attached to Y, and the Y coming back to attach to one. So, what other choice could I have? Yeah? Question mark. 
Why coming to two? Why coming to two? Thank you. Yeah? So then we have three. The, the rest is compulsory because I don't have other choices. Okay. How many people wants to calculate this? Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, let, let's. So I will hand the wave. But uh, now I want you to calculate this, and I think each people will have a different numbers. But but as you rolling the relative things have, is important. So everybody, please write down these two terms down, and start swapping formulas. I'm serious. Sorry, I'm laughing, but I'm I'm serious. Start swapping the fermions. And uh, until they are all in the form of the propagator, which is defined to be the contraction between Psi and the Psi bar. So you see all this, they are all paired up, but we still need to swap things so that they are actually together. And as we have seen in the wake theorem, when you want them to actually be together, you have some minus and signs pop up. So we'll start with giving five minutes of swapping them. It's, it's important. So don't worry about it, there's going to be propagator popping out. Just pay attention how many swaps such that all the four pairs are in the correct order. And of course, as soon as you get any pair to the front or the end, you can just throw them away because they are going to give us propagator. So on the board, it's just sample of how to swap them. I swapped one pair. The rest should be in the same way they can be swapped. OK, how are we doing? Did we finish all the swapping? What happens to, with the two things I asked you to swap? How many swaps you need? You should all give me different numbers, but it's OK. You didn't. What do you mean you didn't? Odd number and an even number. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's good enough, right? That's, that's the only thing you need to keep track is that they need. Uh, because swapping gives you minus sign, basically, the, the, the difference of a minus sign. And then if you are like really careful, you'll be like, but you have all those polar. Propagator and a cancel with Dirac operator, there are so minus minus signs around. How do we know it's not those minus signs? But those only vary about external life, right? Yeah? The, well, okay. My sloppy of answer is you can look at the lecture notes actually to keep track of them with the distribution and do the integrals. Yes, those fall. Though, yeah, actually, you only just, just need to write down all the four propagator. You would look, you look at them, you will realize that uh, the, the operator only acts on one, two, three, four. They are at the same location. 
Okay, that's why they don't, we don't worry about them. And I realize this is a really important minus sign, which tells us in fermionic Feynman rule that uh, when things happen, sometimes you get a minus sign, which cannot be extracted by just drawing a Feynman rule. For a Feynman diagram, well, you can, but uh, by naively looking at the Feynman diagram, you wouldn't know, hey, there's a minus sign. So that's why this exercise is very important because Feynman diagram has an interesting rule. But now we are basically done all the calculation. Let's see what's the last leftover calculation to be done. If you plug the thing we just calculated in the middle, the only thing, we've done everything. Four propagator is canceled by four Dirac operator, and then there is some use. So let me just connect the use for them. Oh, coming back. This guy, the first guy. Yeah, the first guy says U4 is connected to Y, and the y is connected to 1. So in the middle of this, there are some propagators, but they get a cancel. So there should be a propagator of a for y, and that has another propagator of y1. And then, since it's a 1, it, where is my bar? It must be connected to u1. So I know if I tr keep track of all the spinner indexes, that would be obvious because it's a matrix multiplication, but I don't have to. I can just keep track of how I wake it contract. Then I claim that my final amplitude must have a term of four to one. Well, then I think it's, not too hard to believe the other one must be 3 to 2. It's like you keep track of the 3, they go to Z, Z but go back to Z, and then there's another one, then there it goes back to 2, so the other one must be this one. And remember the propagator is all nicely get rid of from the Dirac operator. There's no propagator, so there's propagator, but then they are canceled by the Dirac operator. Because we proved that it's a Green's function in which every direction you act, it will disappear. So, but let's us not forget about the thing we get from the scalar field. Remember there's two scalar fields that can track and give us a propagator? That guy is still there. Again, so if it's U4, go into some internal, internal vertices coming out of a U1, I think it's not too hard to persuade you the flowing momentum in the middle from the scalar field must be this guy. And then I think this is clear from the beginning when we do the Taylor expansion, that the vertex operator is whatever you are Taylor expanding. So there is the Yukawa theory's rule says a fermion can interact with a, a scalar field, and this vertex is minus i lambda. And then there is a fermion rule says if there is a scalar Propagator internal, of course, you write the scalar propagator. And this is from the external lag rule. This is also from the external lag rule. They're all from the external lag. And what we just discovered by, all, by swapping all these indices is that it's telling me that a, there are two indistinct, distinguishable contribution, so we should have get two diagram, two amplitude, and there is a relative minus sign we cannot get rid of. So this amplitude will have another part 
which, where am I going to write to? Never mind. Oh, Carla? Yeah. I think we're going to miss the birthday message. We don't need. Yeah, I, I say that I'll stop two minutes before. I still have three minutes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Walk is a bit early, late. late. Okay, fine. I'll not write down the other amplitude and it says there is a minus sign, but I still have to do something. Okay, but the idea is if you're scattering fermions, this is obviously a diagram. You, you've you've scat scattering scalars before, actually in your homework, because it's like a 5 3 theory, but they could have swept while well, you were swapping fermions. So there will be a minus sign. But unfortunately, the Feynman rule is not that simple. You explore the other minus signs in your tutorial. And the other Feynman rules that I didn't mention, like what is it the anti-fermion? 